Welcome to Appalachian Words, the show about language in Appalachia and the Great Smoky Mountains. I'm your host, Jennifer Heinmiller. I am co-author of the Dictionary of Southern Appalachian and Smoky Mountain English. Appalachian English is a rich language with a long history, but outside of the region, there are more stereotypes than honest conversation about the culture. I wanted to bring this language and its history to a wider audience, so I decided to start this show. Each week I'll be reading and discussing entries in the dictionary, as well as talking about how the dictionary is set up and the process of compiling it. I welcome your questions, comments, stories, or any other message you'd like to send to me. So for this first episode, I'd like to start by introducing the dictionary. The Dictionary of Southern Appalachian and Smoky Mountain English by the late Michael Montgomery and myself, Jennifer Nelson Heinmiller. I want to start off by saying it's not a dictionary in the way you know dictionaries. I mean, yes, it is a book full of words and each word has a definition. So in that sense, it is a dictionary, but it's a lot more than that. It's actually more of an encyclopedia, you might say. It's what we call a historical dictionary. That means that for each entry, you have the usual information such as the term, the part of speech, so whether it's a noun, adjective, whatever, a short definition, and sometimes a little note about the etymology or the history of the term. But one of the things that makes this dictionary unique is that we didn't set out to define the terms ourselves. We let the words and their histories speak for themselves, kind of literally. So for each entry, you have that basic information. There's a longer section that is nothing but examples of how this term has been used in the past. So these examples come from all sorts of material that has been collected and sorted over the past two decades. We've included fragments of diaries from the 1700s, uh, snippets of letters written by soldiers during the Civil War, transcripts of interviews given in the 1930s, 1950s, and after that, Uh, magazine articles, personal letters, novels, memoirs, you name it. If we found a good example of a term that helps us understand its meaning or that really gets to the spirit of that term, we've included it. We also put in as much information as we could about the date and location where the term was used in each of these examples. The dictionary was compiled to connect people from all over the world to Appalachia and to preserve the heritage of this region and its people. Traditional cultures from all over the world are disappearing as we become more global. And don't get me wrong, globalization is awesome for so many things. But I believe there's also value in at least documenting these terms and the history to keep a record of the practices and sayings so future generations can enjoy the language of their grandparents or just a curious piece of Americana from olden times. When I talk about Appalachia, I want to be clear about what I'm talking about, uh, where I'm talking about. So there's a group called the Appalachian Regional Commission, which is a federal state partnership organization, and it helps people in the region improve their quality of life and create economic opportunities. So obviously politics plays a pretty heavy hand in defining the boundaries here, but you'll have that anywhere really. Well, anyway, the Appalachian Regional Commission defines Appalachia as a region that stretches from the hills and mountains of Northern Alabama and Georgia, sometimes even Mississippi, up through the mountains of Southern New York State. So that means that 12 states have areas that are considered part of Appalachia. I mean, think about it. That's over 20% of the United States. Now, for our purposes here, we're dealing with the Southern Appalachian region and the Great Smoky Mountains. So that means we've used sources from eight states, Georgia, Kentucky, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia. That's quite a big chunk of the country, isn't it? It's no wonder that people feel such an attachment to the place all around the country. So I thought it fitting for the first word from the dictionary to introduce in this first episode uh, is home place. If you're from the region or if you've spent time there, this word might bring up some nostalgic feelings. Even if you have no connection to Appalachia, the term probably stirs up some feelings from your own childhood or possibly your ancestral land. 
We define it in the dictionary in the following way. Home place, noun. The site of a residence established by an ancestor on which family descendants live or have lived for one or more generations. The term may include outbuildings and land, but most often it applies to the dwelling or its remains and its immediate surroundings. The term often suggests an extended family's psychological attachment to the place. That definition was written by my friend and predecessor, Michael Montgomery. He and I both have roots in Appalachia, uh, family roots, and I think this is one of those terms that tugs at the heartstrings. Now, I myself didn't grow up in Appalachia, although now I do live in the mountains of North Carolina, and I have spent a lot of time in East Tennessee, especially as a child. But even so, driving through the mountains just feels like going home in a way to me. There's just something about that landscape and the way the light hits the trees and the earth and the spirit of the people there. I think an important part of this definition is in that last sentence. The term often suggests an extended family's psychological attachment to the place. In my experience, I think this is true. So much of my own family is either not originally from the region or now live away from the region, yet they're still drawn there time and again. I suspect a lot of Americans feel the same way, even if they've never set foot there. There really is a pull to the place, isn't there? I think just the amount of tourist traffic in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and uh, other places around there is testament enough to that. Now, I mentioned earlier that we use examples of how the term is used in each entry. I'll be putting these in the show notes so you can see exactly what I mean. Uh, but each of these examples is what we call a citation, and it includes the date, the author or the speaker, the region, uh, when we know it, and the sentence or sentences that show how the term was used. And sometimes there will be a really long paragraph if it gives a really good context or a description of the term. So for the term home place, we have 14 citations. I've picked a few of the ones that stand out to me here. Now some of them are technical, some of them tap into that pulling on the heartstring spirit of a home place. And this is a great illustration of how the same term can take on several meanings, and you can have both a technical literal definition and a more abstract emotional meaning as well for the exact same term. The Dictionary of American Regional English tells us that this term is used especially in the South and South Midland. Uh, these are two regions that are pretty big. I'm not going to name all of the states they cover because it's a long list. But suffice it to say that it's pretty much the southeastern third of the United States. I'll put a link to the, uh, their website so you can see their maps. And they have a lot of really cool information and a fun interactive website. So anyway, uh, the citations from our dictionary. This first one is from 1979 from the book What My Heart Wants to Tell by Verna May Sloan. By the time I was about six years old, my father got a job making chairs for Mrs. Lloyd. About this time, he divided his land and gave it to his children. My brother Vince got the old home place. The next one is from 1991 from the book Home Place by Michael Ann Williams. In order to understand the meaning of old houses, one must first understand the use of the term home place. In southwestern North Carolina, home place generally does not refer to the family's property. It is not the whole spread of land, Arville Green explained, just the immediate area where the old house was, where they all lived and was brought up, they just called that the old home place. Although home place may include the area surrounding the house, it is seldom used as equivalent to house and yard. The meaning is not a simple geographic designation. Home place, under certain circumstances, however, may refer to the site of the house. Individuals may visit the old home place, although the structure itself is gone. And then for the last citation, uh, we have this haunting fragment from the 1997 poetry collection, Briar Poems, by Jim Wayne Miller. We've moved to the cities, moved to town, and left our spirits in the mountains to live like half-wild dogs around the home place.
What a powerful image, that last one. I think all of these are really beautiful depictions of something so integral to a family on a number of levels. I'll put the full entry for the term home place with all the citations in the show notes um, so you can look through them. So I would love to hear your thoughts on the language of Appalachia and the Smoky Mountains and your personal stories. I don't think I mentioned it earlier, but the Dictionary of Southern Appalachian and Smoky Mountain English is currently out of print, although the second edition will be published in the next year or so. So keep an eye out for it. And of course, I will make announcements here about publication. I hope you will join me for the next episode where I will introduce more history and language from Appalachia. We're just getting started here and we have over 10,000 terms to pick from in the dictionary. So uh, I hope you'll stay tuned. Until then, from my home place to yours, take care.